All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to present to you Mr. Travis uh, Adanasio. <laughs> uh, Mr. Adanasio is the AAC Texas past, um, AAC Texas Section past Vice President for Professional Affairs and as such oversees the Infrastructure Report Card Committee. He serves as City Engineer for the City of Hazlitt, which is north of Fort Worth near Texas Motor Speedway. He's, uh, he's the first full-time civil engineer or city engineer and has been in the position since January 2016. Prior to joining to the city, the city of Hazlitt, Mr. Adonacio worked with several private consulting engineering firms for over 14 years, ranging in employee size from six to, o six to over 500 employees with projects across the entire state. The career path has led Mr. Adonacio to understand the infrastructure needs of Texas from both a private investment point of view and the demand of public needs in differing regions and, environment and environments. Mr. Aronacio holds a bachelor's degree in engineering, civil specialty from the Colorado School of Mines, graduating in 2002. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Aronacio. It's always intimidating when you hear your bio because you're like, I really hope I can live up to what I wrote down. <laughs> so, uh, everybody hear me okay? Make sure that in the back we got, wave, hi, Travis Atanasio, uh, here to present today on the 2017 report card for Texas infrastructure. So, how do we get to where we're at now? Well, we gotta base it on something. There's a national report card out there. ASCE has been doing a report card since 1998, updating it every four years. Grades have never been out of a D, so that's pretty bad. Um, the way that they grade the report card is on a simple A to F format so that everybody understands. Everybody from the postman to a city council person to an engineer understands that a D is not a very good grade. To bring all these grades up, ASCE Global estimates there's $2 trillion needed in the next 10 years to bring it to a B. I don't know about you, but I know I've worked on tech stop projects that have lasted longer than 10 years. So this number, it says two trillion to bring it up to, to a B in the next 10 years. There's no way. You know that number is way bigger, right? Anybody had a tech stop project less than 10 years? Besides like a trail or you know, maybe a sidewalk, a driveway permit? <laughs> So about half the states have their own infrastructure report cards. There's a, a website that collects it all. It's infrastructurereportcard.org. You can go look at any state out there. The state report cards follow the same format as the global report card with the same A to F scale. So the 2017 report card for Texas infrastructure is a snapshot in time. It's this year, well, last year. This presentation was started last year. Uh, last year's infrastructure needs for the state in 2017. It's, it's a tool to show the extent, condition, and importance of the state's infrastructure that helps support the life that we like to lead here in Texas. So how do we get this report card? Well, first, we, we hired a consultant, the, uh, the Texas section did, and data was acquired from multiple agencies all across the state, anywhere from cities to counties to TxDOT to the state of Texas itself, and said, Send us your data. Tell us what's good, what's bad. And from that, we develop several facts about each category. Then a review committee is put together. It's about 30 people. I know there's a few people in here that was on the review committee. Uh, they look at the facts that came out of the state agencies and start to grade them, basically, on the following criteria. Capacity, condition, current funding, future need, operation and maintenance, public safety, resilience, and innovation. Each of those categories has point values assigned to it. You add up all the points, and lo and behold, you've got a grade. Then you take that grade, and you compare it to the previous report card. If there's a drastic change in the grade, either up or down, the committee meets again to collaborate why. We meet with the consultant again. We may meet with the state agency again and say, hey, your, your grade changed. What did you do good or what happened? All the grades that are in the report card need to be supported by the facts. 
Now, the actual report card itself is about 110 pages, but some of you at your chairs should have this. This is the uh, pocket card version. It's got a lot of the facts in it and also the grades. And finally, ASC Global gets the final nod because it's their report card. They're the ones that trademarked it. So we have to go through them to make sure that we have the grades correct and that our facts support those grades. So this was a two-year process. We started in 2015, getting the facts, getting the state agencies on board, getting the committee on board. We get the grades done. We're set. We're prepared to release it at CECON 2017, which is in September, mid-September. We're about ready to tell the, the uh, publisher, go ahead, print these, and boom. Okay, we have a problem. <laughs> we have grades that may or may not support what Mother Nature just showed us can, it can do to its infrastructure. Now, we know in infrastructure is vital to our economy and our daily life. And we know that as civil engineers, we're responsible for the design and construction of these improvements. Infrastructure is the backbone to our daily lives. So when Mother Nature comes along and tests it, you want to ha if you're going to stand up and say that you have a grade, you want to make sure that that grade matches what happened on the ground. Luckily for us, most of it did. As you know, Hurricane Harvey started out as a Category 1 hurricane and then just exploded, blew up. That's Port Aransas right there. That's RV park that I've camped at many times. That's the blue crab in Rockport. Many pictures taken underneath that. It's gone. Then it moved on and it parked over Houston. It dumped upwards of 50 inches of rain in Houston, flooded thousands of homes, created hundreds of rescues. Now this is the first natural disaster where the calls for help over social media outnumbered the calls to 911. So this is unprecedented. Then it moved east and flooded Beaumont and, and countless small cities that still don't make the news today. Some of the infrastructure did well. The city of Houston never wa lost their water supply. No major bridge collapses. And the dams that offered millions of people protection from flooding held, even though there was flooding. But that was designed flooding. This is a current picture. This is the Rockport area uh, taken last week. Uh, that was a boat storage facility. And then this, again, is another picture in the Rockport area. Uh, Highway 35, it's a road. It's kind of split like Highway 170 is. So there's a giant median in the middle. It's full of debris. And more and more debris just keeps getting piled in there. The amount of debris that this storm left is, is astonishing. So, here's our grades. We don't do as many categories as the national report card, uh, simply because a lot of them don't apply to Texas. And in this one, we only chose to update seven out of the, out of the 16 that we did in 2012. The reason for that is some of the categories we knew were going to score very low. For instance, uh, schools and mass transit. Texas is huge. Mass transit is going to score low. We also knew that some of the categories would, would score extremely high, like ports and energy. Texas has its own power grid. Can't get much better than that. So of the seven categories that we assessed both in 2012 and 2017, three grades remained the same, which is good. Three increased, which is better, but one did de decrease. So diving into each of these categories, let's start off with aviation. Large airports like DFW, that's a picture, uh, Anthony should know that picture right there. <laughs> or even small airports like Houston Hobby or, or Dallas uh, Love. Let's see, there we go. So Texas is home to 24 of the primary commercial airports, servicing nearly 80 million passengers in 2015. And that has increased by about 8.5% from 2010 to 2015. And the FAA, they do a lot of grant funding, which is why that grade got up to a B minus. So a little airport trivia for you. How many airports in the top 10 worst airports for delays does Texas have? Any guesses? 
The answer is two. Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston-Bush Intercontinental. Now, the number one reason for delay is weather. DFW, lightning, hail, and ice storms. And in, in Houston, thunderstorms, fog, and an occasional hurricane rolls through. So why is this important? Why do, we, why do we need to know this? Well, shutting down one of those two airports for more than four hours results in a ripple effect in the United States economy. Upwards of 75 cents per dollar will be lost to productivity over the next five to seven business days. Taken over a year span, that's not that much. Taken over a week span, you can see that ripple effect happen. Bridges. Big, tall, new bridges. Old bridges. Old bridges that still function today in the same condition. And even small county and city bridges. So there's a, over 53,000 bridges in Texas. That's twice as many as any other state in the, U, in the United States. 65% of these bridges are on system bridges, which means on the TxDOT system leaving 35% in either city or county maintained. The number of structurally deficient bridges on the TxDOT system dropped from 2.6% to 1.7%. It's important to know what a structurally deficient bridge is. The word sounds structurally deficient like you don't really want to go cross that bridge, but that's not really what it is. So a structurally deficient bridge has an extreme restriction on its load carrying capacity. Say a 20,000 pound design bridge can only transport 10,000 pounds. <clears throat> Perhaps the bridge is closed. That's one you don't want to go across. It's frequently overtopped during flooding, and that creates severe traffic delays. Or it requires immediate rehabilitation to remain open. <clears throat> so you remember that 1.7% are structurally deficient. That's not that much, right? 900 bridges in the entire state. I will take those odds, given that if I was going to Vegas, I would take those odds, that I would not have a problem with that bridge. But what if I told you that one county out of the 254 in Texas has more structurally deficient bridges than any other county, including the top 10 combined? Now what if I told you that county bordered one of the four major metropolitan areas in the state? Is that time to listen about structurally deficient bridges? Maybe. Dams got a grade of D, large dams, even larger dams, small dams, or dams that need a lot of help. That's Lake Louisville, just FYI, that has been repaired. I was supposed to tell that when I put that slide up last time. So the state budget is only two and a half million dollars for the entire state of Texas for dam inspectors to go out and, and rate these dams. In 2012, 217 dams, since 2012, have seen hazard classification increases. That means their hazard has gone up from a low hazard to a high hazard dam. Now the cost to rehabilitate these high hazard dams, 812 million. You can do the math there, 2 million for inspections, 812 million for rehabilitation. Now in total, here's a good sign, uh, 1,263 high hazard dams in Texas 80% of them have an emergency action plan. That's an increase from 10% in 2005, a dramatic increase. That's what kept this grade from dropping, seeing that the rehabilitation numbers went up so much. So why are dams so important to Texas? That's a good question. The computer can't even answer it. There you go. So everything you see there in blue is a lake whether it be a large lake or a small stock pond. Anybody want to guess how many of the lakes are natural? One is the common answer, and it didn't even start in Texas. It started in Louisiana. And it started, oops, went too far. Started in Louisiana with a log jam back in around 1100, 1200 time frame. Uh, the guy that created Shreveport, Henry Miller Shreve wanted to make the Red River navigable, so he started removing that log jam, and he removed it right up to the mouth of, of Ten Mile Bayou, and that's what created Caddo Lake, and that Caddo Lake, the headwaters reached into Texas, so that's the natural water body. Now, since that time, Caddo Lake has had a dam retrofitted to it 
So the actual answer is zero. There's not a single natural water body in Texas that is not created by some type of dam. Oops. Paper's flying everywhere. Water earned a grade of D plus. So water is essential, essential to life, essential to everything that we do around us. And planning for that water is what's going to take Texas further into the 21st century. There's going to be a lot of challenges created by that. The population of Texas is going to be going towards 51 million people by 2070. And 70% of that population is going to live in what's called the Texas Triangle. That's DFW, Houston, Austin, San Antonio area. 70% of those people living in that area, all the water happens to be in East Texas. That's a significant challenge to bring that water to the major metropolitan areas. Conserving water is, is important. So if a gallon of water costs a, a dollar to make, 15 cents of that is, goes into the chemicals for the treatment and the power of the water treatment plant, and 85 cents goes into the debt, the infrastructure costs, and the personnel. So of that dollar of water, 10 to 30 percent of it is lost or not billable to the consumer because of either water main breaks or leaks firefighting activities, or plain out theft. So when you lose the water, you have to adjust the rates to compensate for that lost revenue. Something important to remember is that water supply corporations and municipalities are not prof on non-profits. So when your water bill increases, there's a reason behind it. It's either regulation or cost or lost water, and that, those revenues have to be made up. In the flood control category, Texas earns a D. This is Dallas in 2015. I'm sure people remember that driving around here. Uh, this is Wemberley in that same year, a uh, tragic loss of life with that flood. That bridge is about 27 feet off the ground. And you can see that that top rail was, was uh, inundated completely. So now we're talking 30 feet plus of water. That's, a, that's an amazing amount of water coming down, coming down the river. So Texas is unique. We have coasts, we have rivers, we have a new term that was introduced to me, geomorphology, that contributes to the water of the state. Flood preparation, floodplain management, that's largely left to the municipalities or the counties. There's no central authority in Texas to, to deal with that. Good news is, though, in the 2017 legislative session, the Texas Water Development Board will be spearheading the first national, or I'm sorry, statewide flood plan. And it's going to be based off of the, uh, the water plan where the state is broken up into regions because the flooding that happens in Dallas is not the same flooding that happens in Lubbock or the flooding in Houston is not happening over in Midland. So they're going to break it up, but it's going to be a statewide flood plan and it's going to be spearheaded by the Texas Water Development Board. So when, when it comes to flooding, does everybody know that you can buy flood insurance if you're not in the floodplain? Hopefully every engineer knows that. You need to tell your neighbors. It's a good thing to have because when it comes to flooding, nobody's 100% safe. If your car gets flooded, your car insurance covers that. If your house gets flooded, your homeowner's insurance doesn't cover that. Now, flooding is, is very unique when the insurance agencies come around and they go, well, that was a water main break. The water from outside your house entered inside your house. That's a flood. Or you have an inlet that's by your house and it gets clogged. Same thing, water from outside entered in. Now, I did have an insurance agent tell me one time, if it's flooding and you see a river coming up and you don't have flood insurance, cut a hole in the roof. Not a, don't swear by this, but that's what they said because they can't tell whether the water came in through the door or through the roof. And you have justification saying, I thought I was going to have to escape through the roof, so I cut a hole in it. <laughs> So when a, when a flood comes, what, do you, what happens? This is, this is a house in Houston of a friend of mine. You can see the line of where the water was, uh, where the brick changes color. That's where the water was. One of the things that, that they stressed, and I'm a, I was a volunteer firefighter in a past life, but the number one thing left behind when people evacuate are pets. You grab the photo albums. You grab the safety deposit box. You grab you know, the kids' school artwork and you leave fluffy. 
just doesn't enter your mind, that you have to bring your pets with you when you evacuate. So number one thing forgotten was pets. Once the flood comes, it destroys everything. Just, it's gone. Water just takes it away. It's, it's amazing what Mother Nature does. This is part of the cleanup process. You've got to get everything wet out of your house so that you can start drying it. Now, the one thing the, uh, that they told me in this was that they couldn't find fans anywhere. They were all gone. They went to Home Depot. They went to Lowe's everywhere. Gone. They said, we should have brought fans from when we evacuated in Dallas. I'm sure Dallas had plenty of fans and electrical cords. We didn't even think about it. We knew we were coming home to a wet house. Now, this family is, is living on their second floor now out of microwaves and coolers. Uh, they're much more fortunate than other people. They estimate about six to eight months before they can get back to uh, somewhat of a normal life. Our roads got a D. Big highways down to FM roads. So, as I said, Texas has nearly double the bridges of any other state. They have more road lane miles than any other state as well. Now, opposite of bridges, only 26% are on system, leaving 74% either county or city maintained. Now, the 2015 statewide assessment on TxDOT roads rated pavement in good condition 87%. That's going to drop down to 83% by 2025. So simply put, the roads are aging faster than the money is coming in to fix them. This is a st sad statistic that just got passed again. Uh, every day since November 7, 2000, somebody has died on a Texas highway. TxDOT, you know, has the standard buckle your seatbelt, don't drink and drive, pay attention, um, know the speed limit. That's all, we hear that all the time. But when, you're when, you're, when you think about that, that somebody's died since 2000 every day, that, that's a more meaning statistic than, than telling somebody to wear your seatbelt. Wastewater earned a D. It's our loan drop in the report card from 2012. And the reason for that is there's unauthorized and untreated wastewater discharges. This was a shocking statistic to me that 37% of river miles and 43% of reservoir acres, 24% of bays are having impaired water quality. I don't, who fishes in this in the state here? Like, I, I'm a fisherman. Is anybody else? That's kind of a shocking statistic to me. So, major reason for wastewater uh, overflows is, is the stormwater gets in the manholes, uh, floods the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we can solve this problem by using watertight manholes or pulling the lines out of the old stream beds, which is I know a time-honored civil engineering practice, but Perhaps it's time to rethink that since the watertight manholes don't last as long as they should. So that's an overview of our grades. Do a couple solutions. This one is, is the most important to me. Uh, invest now for dividends later. Treat infrastructure like an asset. Uh, infrastructure needs to have increased long-term, consistent state and local level funding with those funds never being used to offset other parts of the budget. And I'll show you why. Legislative accounting tricks. In 2015, Texas voters overwhelmingly passed an amendment that $5 billion in sales tax money would be transferred to the state highway fund. That was supposed to take place in 2017 and 2018. Then after that, 2018, the fund would get 35% of sales tax on new cars and rentals, creating a consistent funding flow into the state highway fund. This was a great thing that the legislature did in 2015 and the voters uh, approved it overwhelmingly. So fast forward to the 2017 legislative session, and magically the budget was about $2.5 billion short. Texas is nice to have a nice rainy day fund balance of about $9.7 billion. So the question is, do legislators tap the rainy day fund, or do they go and try to find it from somewhere else? Well, unfortunately... The answer is somewhere else. The state comptroller de deemed that those payments that were supposed to be made in 17 and 18 could be made in 18 and 19, thus balancing the books. This is unconstitutional. This is a constitutional amendment that the voters 
voted on, but the legislature didn't seem to care because they've done it in the past. So to put this simply, this is like floating a check to the electric company. Did your lights turn off? No. Did you have the money? No. But the state Supreme Court has ruled these deferments constitutional. So why do we worry about that? Because deferments in 2015 and 2017 are, and the highway fund totaled $7.9 billion. So when, they, when the legislature convenes in 2019 and that $5 billion transfer comes due, what happens then? You're already starting $7.9 billion in the hole. Do we attack the 35% on the uh, sales tax? Who knows? We won't know in 20, in, until 2019 when they reconvene. So I talk about, in, and in the report card, there's a lot of solutions to the investment or in, to, to uh, raise the grade for infrastructure, and they largely revolve around investment. And I know, as engineers, we don't control that. The Texas legislature controls that. The city councils control that. Um, heck, even the federal government controls that. So what are some individual solutions that we can do as engineers that we can tell our neighbors to do? And that's what I've got here. This isn't in the report card. These are ones that I've come up with uh, in talking to various groups. Adopting a storm drain. Some solutions are so simple. If, if homeowners associations adopted storm drains in their neighborhood and swept out the street gutters and the storm drains, you would never have a clogged inlet anywhere in the city. And on that note, don't sweep or blow your grass into the gutter. It, that, it needs to go back into the lawn. Otherwise, it ends up in a giant ball about this big that uh, some poor EIT, mainly me, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, had to get in with a piece of rebar and start jabbing at it. It's not very fun, and it was gross. <laughs> Second, don't pour chemicals or flush drugs down the drain. Wastewater treatments plants remove 95 to 98 percent of the pharmaceuticals found in your water. That's pretty good, but it's not 100 percent. There's growing concern in the scientific community that certain drugs may interact with each other. And while our bodies may be able to shrug off a relatively large dosage one time, the science is out on if that same dosage hits you over the next 40 to 50 years in your water, what happens? So don't, don't flush those down the drains. Don't pour chemicals down your drains. Maintain your vehicle. Gas, oil, and other chemicals, they soften, a soften asphalt and cause it to break down at an unnaturally fast rate. The thing is, roads and parking lots, asphalt's the answer, right? Unless there's a concrete guy in here. <laughs> no, precast. <laughs> also, know your vehicle's capabilities. This is a half-ton truck pulling a gooseneck trailer with a three-quarter ton truck on the back. The weight estimate on this is about 14,000 pounds, or roughly 6,000 over what the truck can safely tow. Of course, it's not what you can tow, it's what you can stop. Remember that when you're towing something very heavy. It's not how you got it up to speed, it's can you get it back down. This truck is a little bit more suited for that type of load, and this person has done the right thing and gotten it weighed. So why is this important? Remember back when I said 35% of the bridges are off system? Those don't get inspected nearly as much as the on-system bridges. Some of those bridges have load limits of 10,000 pounds. So driving that over that bridge, you're going to cause some damage to it and to your truck. Don't do that, people. Next one. There we go. There we go. Uh, know your local council person. So the old adage of think local, act global really should be think local, act local. Because your day-to-day -day lives are more affected by your local council person than anyone in Austin or Washington. Why is your street filled with potholes? Because the street over screamed louder. Why does the water taste funny? Well, the water department said we could get by this year without that chemical. You got a new school in your neighborhood. Where's the sidewalks? Sorry, that money was spent on Christmas decorations and fireworks. Every city budget is set in September. It's a public document. They go online in October. Most cities run October 1 to September 30th. You can pull those documents in an open records request, or you can just go on a website and see the, the budget for every city. Study it. Know it. Go to your council person. Make them justify to you why this didn't happen, but this did. 
One of the most important things you can say to anybody that's elected, I vote and I'm very influential among my friends. That'll get you really far into the door. Have a plan. Have a plan in case something happens. No other ways to get home or to get out. The major reason the city of Houston didn't evacuate for Hurricane Harvey is that they believe that I-45 would be so jammed that the storm would hit while cars were on the road. They thought this because during Hurricane Rita, the average time was 14 to 24 hours to get from Houston to Dallas. I've personally had friends tell me they've made it in six hours by taking FM roads through College Station and Waco. Most of them were Aggies and they knew those FM roads, so way to go. And finally, this is from the Department of Homeland Security, but it applies to infrastructure too. If you see something wrong with infrastructure, say something. Larger cities have a non-emergency call number such as 411. Smaller cities, like the one I work in, always have somebody that'll answer the phone. If there's an inlet clogged, a tree's fallen on a bridge, the water smells funny, you suddenly lose your water pressure, or you see some unusual erosion, or maybe you're driving by a creek and you're thinking, I've never seen that creek out of its banks before. Tell someone about it, report it. The people that are in charge of the infrastructures, the cities, the TxDOT, everybody, they don't know there's a problem unless it gets reported, unless they happen to be driving on that same route. There is an app, it's available in the App Store and Android Play and the Amazon Store. Uh, help restore America's infrastructure. It's really handy to have on your phone if you need to pull up a quick fact if you're talking to somebody and they say, well, there's not that many bridges in Texas. You can go, yes, there is. There's 53,000 bridges in Texas. It's, really, it's a really fun game, too, for a trivia night. <laughs> so in closing today, this is a review of the major infrastructure in the state that needs attention. We did the research for you. ASCE did the research for you. We urge you to get the message out now to your council members, to your mayors, to your local state representatives, to your neighbors, so that you, there's more than one voice. The infrastructure of Texas affects us all. Now it's our duty to treat it like the asset that it is and make it function the way we want it to. I appreciate the opportunity. Again, here's the grades. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. We have a, a minute or two for questions if anybody has one. And if not, I'll tell you one that I got from another presentation. Okay. Oh, got one right here. Yes, sir. I believe the city of Houston did their own report card a few years ago. I'm not sure if that's been updated recently. Um, it's, it's a pretty large endeavor. And when you get more and more local, the data is a little bit harder to get. Uh, the statewide data you can definitely get, but local data, not so much. Yes, sir. Uh, which city? Georgetown, okay. Excellent. So I'll finish up with one of the questions that I got, and it was uh, from a infrastructure kind of action action group. They, they pride themselves on being able to go in front of Dallas City Council and say that they're the experts on infrastructure because they invite speakers in and, and they learn. And this group was really great. They were very interactive. They said, what's your biggest concern when you see these grades? And I had to sit and, and just pause for a second and go, dams. It's the one we don't think about. That picture that I showed you with, with uh, Lake Louisville where the, the spillway had, or the, I'm sorry, the embankment had, had caved in, if Lake Louisville were to break, you're talking downtown Dallas, just gone. You know, these, and the amount of money that's put towards dams and their rehabilitation is so small. And so many of these dams are on private land. They're owned by, they were owned by the NRCS, you know, maybe back in the 50s when flood control was an issue. And they've been turned over to private property owners. Uh, we have a huge feral hog problem in this state. Those feral hogs can burrow right through a dam. Um, so that was my answer to that question. Those are the ones that scare me the most because when I was working at Freeze and Nichols, I was doing models on what they call the sunny day breach. 
And that's, that's the scariest one is all of a sudden it's sunny day, 95 degrees out, and bam, here comes a wall of water. So that's why emergency action plan is important, um, not only for, small, for large high hazard dams, but in my opinion, small dams. But I'm not a legislator, so I can't, I can't make that move. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>